But uh, last night with Barry was just awesome. If anybody missed that, I encourage you to get that. That was powerful, powerful. And those of you who are watching, if you didn't tune in last night, it is available. Uh, you can get that. And I can promise you what Barry ministered is the kind of thing that if people just understood what Barry said last night, and if there was no doubt, if you just took it and put it into practice, you don't need anything else. Amen. That would solve all of the problems right there. But, you know, we have to say things over and over and over and sometimes we approach it from a little different standpoint and stuff. And that will, uh, you know, you look at it from a different angle and you understand it and stuff. But um, I tell you, that was powerful. I've got a teaching on imagination that is the exact same thing. But he was just calling it, what do you see? But it's the same thing. You have to see something on the inside before you see it on the outside. And, you know, whether you know it or not. That's already working in you. It's already working. It's working 100% of the time. If you aren't seeing victory, it's because you aren't seeing victory. It's because you hadn't seen it on the inside first. It's working already for everybody. So anyway, I'm going to really be emphasizing today in the things that the Lord shared with me. I'm going to be emphasizing uh, the importance of the word of God being like a seed in your life. And let me just say that there are some people that if you misunderstood what I'm saying, you could sit there and think, well, that's contrary to what Barry said, but it's not. And Barry, if you misunderstood what he said, you might think that's contrary to what I'm saying, but it's not. And Barry said that dozen, a dozen times last night. He's not de-emphasizing the word. It's just that you have to, you have to believe the word has to come alive on the inside of you before you speak it. There's nothing wrong with speaking the word, but if you're speaking it, as he said, like a parrot, it doesn't carry that power. A scripture goes along with that is Hebrews chapter four, verse two, the word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You have to speak the word in faith. It's not magic. It's not just some formula that you repeat it and it works. But if you speak it from your heart in faith, the word is super powerful and Barry agrees with all that. So anyway, people tend to be really simplistic. They, they don't seek the Lord with their whole heart. They don't give it their full attention. They listen to one message and they just, they don't try and figure anything out. So anyway, what I'm going to be sharing is not contrary to what Barry shared. It's not Barry, what Barry shared is not contrary to what I said. It, it's just, they fit together. You know, let me use this verse to just illustrate this. Romans chapter 3 and in verse 28, it says, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Then put that together with James chapter 2, verse 24. You see how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Some people think, well, that's contradictory. Did you know Martin Luther thought that this was so contradictory. Romans 3, 27 is what is the verse that the Lord used to speak to Martin Luther as he was climbing up the steps at the Vatican, going through his rituals, and he just realized that this isn't it. And Romans 3, 27 uh, just transformed his life. And because he got a revelation of grace and that we are justified by faith and not by works, that was so real in him that he actually thought that James should not have been in the Bible. James 2, verse 24, I think it is, that we just read. He says that can't, that, that's contradictory. And so he actually lobbied to take the book of James out of the Bible because he couldn't reconcile the two. Yeah. And yet they, they, count, they balance each other perfectly. John Calvin said it this way. He said, faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. So all this is saying is it's faith is the only thing that is required on your part to be in right standing with God. And that is absolutely true. But people could misunderstand that and think, so then it doesn't matter what I do. Well, if it's true faith, it's going to be consistent with God's word. You could put, man, I could spend the entire time ministering on this. I'm trying to get into what I want to share. I'm just showing you the balance here. But... Um, the scripture says over in 1 John chapter 2, if a man says that he loves God and isn't living according to what the word of God says, he's a liar and the truth isn't in him. You're deceiving your own self. 
See, that's not contradictory. It's just saying that faith alone is what changes you. But you can tell whether it's true saving faith because it will have actions that go along with it. If a person took the statement that faith alone sa saves and then they say, so I'm not going to live holy. I'm not going to seek God. I'm not going to do anything else because I believe on Jesus. And so I'll never seek him. I'll never study the word. I'll never pray. I don't care how I live because faith is what changed me. Well, then your faith isn't real faith because saving faith will always have actions. James chapter two, verse 20, faith without works is dead. So anyway, you find in scripture that there's things that look contrary to each other, but they aren't contrary. They balance each other. And if you don't look at the opposite, apparent opposite, well, then you haven't really understood it unless you can match those things together. Same thing is true about grace and faith. You know, there's people, we've, the body of Christ can basically be divided into the grace camp, those who preach it's all grace, or those who are into faith, that man, you've got faith, you can move God, you can make things happen. Those look contrary. But the Bible says in James, or excuse, where is that? Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not grace or faith. It's the combination of the two. You have to put faith in what God's grace has already provided. To prove that second uh, chapter of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11, it says the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. If grace alone saved you, all men would be saved because God's grace has come unto all men. But Romans chapter 5 verse 2 says we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So even though grace is what saves us, you access faith, grace by faith. So it takes the combination of the two. It's like sodium and chloride. Both of those are poison. Either one will kill you if you eat enough of it. And yet if you mix it together, it makes salt and you'll die without it. Did you know grace by itself will kill you? It'll lead you into lasciviousness where it's all of the grace of God. And so it doesn't matter how I live. And Satan will take advantage of you and kill you because of that. If all you do is focus on faith, then you'll get into this thing where faith moves God. And I'm going to make God do something. God's not the one that's stuck. He's not the one that needs to move. By grace, he's already moved. Faith moves you. It doesn't move God. Faith is important to reach out and appropriate what God's already provided. So anyway, on and on I could go with apparent contradictions. But let me turn over to Mark chapter 4. And I just want to emphasize how important the Word of God is. You know, one last illustration before I get into this. And, uh, you know, the Greek word rhema means a spoken word or a quickened word. And this is the reason that Bible, Rhema Bible Training Center named their uh, Bible college Rhema. It means a spoken or a quickened word, whereas the Greek word logos means a written word. And what they would teach is that this is the written word of God and it's accurate, but it has no power until it's spoken to you, until it comes alive on the inside of you. And that's a true statement. But I've actually heard people take that and say, well, God quickened to me and spoke to me about prosperity or about healing or something. But there was one pastor in uh, Denver that I knew that he divorced his wife and went and married somebody else. And he said, it's because those scriptures about marriage and stuff, those weren't rhema to me. <laughs> it was just logos and God didn't speak it to me. That's weird. <laughs> Did you know God spoke all of these words, even the Logos, the written word is spoken by God. And if it's not alive to you, it's not God that didn't make it alive. It's you that hadn't meditated on it and let it come alive on the inside of you. Every word of God, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So all scripture is spoken by God. And if it hadn't come rhema to you, if it hadn't come alive, it's not God who hasn't quickened it. It's you that hadn't spent the time in the word or you've let the opinion of other people or your own body or circumstances keep that word from coming alive. 
So anyway, my point is that yes, everything is true that you can't just stand on a scripture and quote that by his stripes I'm healed and yet you see yourself sick on the inside. It has to come alive to you. It has to be a word from God, a living word. But God wants every word to be living on the inside of you. And so how do you get it there? You, you need to get into the word of God. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. Mark chapter four, this is a parable about how important the word of God is. And it says in Mark chapter four and in verse 26, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that, the full corn in the ear, but when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. So Jesus is teaching a parable and he's using the way a physical seed works in this life to illustrate how the word of God works in our life. Now that's important. If you go up to the 14th verse, he actually taught 13 parables in one day and right here in the parable, in the Mark chapter four, I think there's four different parables that he gave and everyone is talking about the word of God and how important the word of God is. And so Mark chapter four, verse 14 says, the sower sows the word. So this is really not teaching you about how seeds work. It's using your understanding of how seeds work in the natural realm to illustrate how the word works in the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm, your spiritual life is as dependent on the word of God as this physical world is on physical seeds. Amen. Did you know everything in this physical world comes from seeds? Man, if I had time, we could just expand on this forever. This is just profound, the things that he's saying. But when God created all of the trees, he didn't just say, let there be trees, let there be animal. If he had said that, well, then when those trees and animals died, he had had to create new trees and animals. But he said, let the earth bring forth trees whose seed is in itself. Let the grass come. And every time he said something about seeds. So he created the original plants and animals and people with the ability to procreate through seeds. Everything that's alive on this planet came from seeds. All grass, all trees, all animals, and you and I are a product of seeds. I'm not going to explain this in more detail. I'm assuming that everybody understands how people get born. You don't come through the stork. You don't uh, get it from Amazon. You have to plant a seed and you have to uh, birth a child, you have to birth trees, you have to birth grass. Everything that's alive comes from seeds. In the same way that the physical world is dependent upon seeds, the spiritual world is dependent upon seeds. The seed of God's word. First John, first, excuse me, first Peter chapter one, verse 23 says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. That verse calls the word of God an incorruptible seed. And the word for seed there is the Greek word sperma or spora. And spora is referring to, you know, how flowers pollinate. A spore is how it pollinates. And the word spora is a derivative of the Greek word sperma, where we get the word sperm from. In the same way that a child has to be conceived by a sperm, a plant has to be pollinated by a spore, you have to conceive your miracle, your healing. That is so simple. You got to have somebody to help you to misunderstand this. <laughs> but did you know that the average person, they're just praying, oh God, heal me. Oh God, touch me. And yet you hadn't planted a seed. That's as crazy as a woman saying, oh God, I want a child, but she won't have a relationship with the man. You aren't going to get pregnant. There was only one virgin birth and you aren't going to be the second one. <laughs> Unless you get a seed planted, you aren't going to get pregnant. It's as foolish as a person that prays over barren ground and says, oh God, please give me corn. 
I need a crop, and yet you haven't planted corn. If you don't plant it, you won't get it. If you don't uh, have a physical relationship with a man, you aren't going to get pregnant. And if you don't get into the Word of God, you aren't going to have God give you a word that will paint a picture and show you like what Barry was talking about. The word, we wouldn't know how to spell Jesus if it wasn't for the word of God. We wouldn't have known that Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. We wouldn't even have those thoughts. Without the word of God, you would just sit there and you'd be like an unbeliever that just sits there and whatever will be, will be. And you're just wishing and a hoping and a praying. But there is no such thing as faith and standing and having a word from God. Barry... The Lord spoke specifically to him. He wasn't going to die, but that was based on who knows how many years and thousands of hours worth of study in the word that gave him that knowledge. You see how all of this stuff works together. It is true that you can't just sit there and just speak a scripture and quote what I said and get healed. But you can take what I said, and if you meditate on that word, it'll give you revelation. And then when it becomes alive on the inside of you, and you speak the word of God in faith, the word is powerful. But you've got to plant God's word in your heart. And I commend you for coming here. Man, some of you have come all the way from Israel, from other countries, and you've put some effort into this, and praise God, but... As important as this is, and I believe people are being healed this week, this needs to be a lifestyle, not just something you do one week and you have a week conference. It needs to be where you live. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. They don't just go to a conference of faith. They live there. They don't vacation there. They don't go there for a devotion every day. I'm not against a devotion, but a devotion is no good if you spend 30 minutes in the word and then you wash it down with all kinds of unbelief and doubt during the day. You've got to live by faith. This needs to become a lifestyle. Amen. People hate me using this comparison, but it's true. So I'll say it. Uh, Galatians 4, 16, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Pe most people are fighting with their weight, but you know what they do? Instead of eating properly and exercising properly for the rest of their life, they want to have a diet. And that for a week or for a month, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get to where I need to be. And then as soon as you get to where you need to be, you go back to living a sloppy life and not exercising and overeating. That's not the way it works. Having the proper weight is as simple as just eating less than your body needs and do that over a long period of time. And I guarantee you, you'll lose weight. It's that simple. But this yo-yo dieting and stuff, see, this is what a lot of Christians are doing spiritually. You come to a meeting and you're going to feast on the word and then you're going to go home and wash it down with, uh, you know, as the stomach turns on television <laughs> and all this kind of stuff and then wonder why it's not working. You got to get to where you live this way. This says that the man takes seed and he puts it in the ground and he leaves it there and he sleeps and rises night and day. That means that it's going to take time. You can't just plant the seed and then the next morning you're going to have your harvest. You're going to have to leave it there. If you go out and dig up the seed every single day, it'll never germinate. If you put the word in your heart for 30 minutes, but then you spend the rest of the day living in unbelief and listening to stuff. And, you know, I watched my television program today. It was really awesome. <laughs> you guys might have missed my television program. You ought to go watch it. It was really good. But... Um, Anyway, I was talking about that the average person, according to a Barna survey, spends four to five hours a day on their phone. And I can guarantee you, you aren't talking to people four or five hours a day. You're looking at the news, you're playing games, you're, you're surfing the internet, looking for things, just wondering, your mind wandering on all of the sewage that's on the internet and stuff like this. If you spend four to five hours a day washing down your 30-minute devotion... It's not going to do you any good. You have to plant this seed in the ground and leave it there. But if you plant a seed and then you go out and dig it up by thinking contrary to everything God said, it's not going to germinate. You have to sow the seed and you have to leave it there night and day and just trust that it's going to work. It says he doesn't know how it works. You know, I can't fully explain 
all of these things. I can't explain how you can take a kernel of corn and plant it in the ground and you'll get a stalk with three ears of corn on it and each ear of corn will have somewhere around 700 ears of corn. So that's 2,100 ears of corn for every one that you put in the ground. I don't understand all how that works, but that doesn't keep me from using it. I can plant the seed and go ahead and benefit from it whether I understand everything or not. You don't have to understand everything to get the word to work for you. If you would just commit yourself to it, put it in your heart and refuse to allow anything to come against it. I hadn't got time to teach the previous parable right here in Mark chapter four, but that talks about how the seed was sown in four different types of ground. And in every type of ground, Satan came immediately to steal the word that was sown in your heart. And you have to protect this word. And it's the same thing in the spiritual realm. We're sharing truths with you that could literally transform your life, but you have to protect it. Satan is going to try and steal this from you. And a lot of people, they just don't protect the word. They aren't committed to this. You've got to be committed to the truth of God's word. So this man sowed seed in the ground, slept and rose night and day, and it just sprung and grew up. He didn't know how it worked, but he knew how to work it. And he just kept the word in his heart. And look at this. This is one of the most radical things that God ever showed me. In verse 28, it says, For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. Did you know the phrase of herself is the Greek word automatos? And that's where we get automatic and automatically from. Did you know if you sow seed in the ground, that ground just automatically starts working to release the power that's in that seed. Did you know when you put the word in your heart, and it doesn't have to be the word, when you sow anything, when thoughts come into your heart, your heart just automatically starts working to bring whatever you put in your heart into manifestation. Barry talked about this last night. That it doesn't have to only be the word of God. If you are seeing other things in your life, your whole body and everything about you is working to bring that to pass. Uh, Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Your life is the sum total of the way you've thought. Thank you for that thunder of silence. People don't like that because they think, I didn't believe for this. Well, you not, may not have believed for it in the sense that you wanted it, but you thought things that allowed it to come. You may not have thought, I want to be sick, but your thinking was sick. And you're thinking, well, I'm only human. I'm just a man. And after all, you know, the COVID's going around and it's uh, flu season and stuff like that. You may not go out and think, I want to be sick, but you are seeing yourself as only human. And so you are receptive to that stuff. I think one of the reasons that Adam lived to be 930 years old is because he didn't know how to die. He didn't know that at 30 he was over the hill. They didn't give him black balloons. He didn't know these kind of things. It took 930 years for Adam to learn how to die. We've been trained how to die. We expect it. You start expecting to get old and senile and you start expecting things and you may not like it and you may even hate the thought, but yet you sit there and say, well, it runs in the family. Heart disease runs in the family. And so you'll sit there and confess it and you are speaking forth what you see in your heart. You're basing your life on what everybody else has got. When you start teaching that it's God's will to heal every single person, I can guarantee you people are going to come up and say, well, what about so-and-so? You know what? That's because they have seen something that looks contrary to what the Word of God says, and they are speaking what they see in their heart, what they've seen in their experience, and, that's, and they will fight to be normal and sick and diseased and poor like everybody else because that's the image that they have on the inside. This says that the earth brings forth fruit of herself automatically and notice it says that the earth brings forth fruit of herself. Here's a radical thought, and I hadn't got time to fully develop this, but hopefully you can get this. The seed is an incorruptible seed, sperm. It's male. Your heart is female. And when the seed, the sperm, is sown in your heart, it just automatically conceives and begins 
a birthing process. Exactly the same as in the physical realm. And again, I could expound on this more. Let me just refer to this. You can go study this later. But in the book of Genesis, it's, I, I've got to read some of this because I'm not sure I'll quote it. But let me read this in Genesis chapter 1. There's numerous times in this one chapter that the Lord spoke to the earth. In verse 11, Genesis 1, 11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding uh, fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself. See the emphasis on seeds? He didn't just create these things. He created them with the ability to procreate through seeds. And notice he said, let the earth bring forth grass. He didn't say, let there be grass. He sowed a seed, his word. The word of God is an incorruptible seed. And he, he said, let the earth bring forth. Did you know seeds? I've heard people before say, and I understand what they're saying. I'm not trying to be contentious, but I've heard people take an apple seed and say, anybody can count the number of apple uh, seeds in an apple, but nobody can count the number of apples in a seed. And the point that they're making is in that seed, you plant it, it produces an apple tree. It could produce hundreds and hundreds of apples over the life of that tree. And then each one of those seeds produce hundreds of apples. And so nobody can understand. I understand what they're saying, the potential, but technically speaking, did you know a seed doesn't, an apple seed does not produce apples. What an apple seed does, it activates the ground. And the ground is what produces the apple tree. That's the reason that the Lord spoke to the earth and said, let the earth bring forth grass and trees. And then later in that first chapter, he also said up here about the animals in verse uh, 20, 22. And God Bless those in verse, let, where is it? Verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. He said, let the earth bring forth. Did you know in the ground was already elephants, giraffes, dogs, cats. Everything was in the ground. Here's another way of saying this. Did you know that everything that is above the ground was at one time in the ground? Most people don't think this way. But did you know everything that you see, this wood that's up here, did you know this wood grew out of the ground? Did you know the materials that are in the carpet, if it's wool or if it's something like that, that came from a sheep who came out of the ground, the animals came out of the ground. If it's petroleum products, the stuff that's in your phone, plastic, did you know all that stuff came out of the ground? Did you know that diamond, silver, gold all comes out of the ground? Steel is rocks that's been reformatted. Everything that is above the ground came out of the ground. When God created the heavens and the earth, he put everything that his creation would ever need in the dirt. But the dirt is feminine. It needed a sperm. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. He sowed a seed, a sperm, and all of a sudden that seed is what activated what was already in the ground. You know, when a woman gets pregnant, the seed is sown and everything that it takes to produce a baby is already in the woman except a sperm. And then once the sperm comes, well, then the rest of it is all inside the woman. It's all the way God created women to be. Did you know that when you get born again in your spirit, you've got everything. You are identical to Jesus. First John chapter four, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the next world, but so are we in this world. Your spirit is identical to Jesus. And there's just so many other scriptures Ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 through the end of the chapter says that he prays that your eyes would be open so that you could see the exceeding greatness of his power. The same power that he used when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead and set him in his own right hand in the heavenly places. In your spirit you have raising from the dead power. 
you got more than enough power to heal you from whatever's got you in a wheelchair to whatever's caused Down syndrome. You've got resurrection power in you. That's the dirt that's in you. Your spirit is already perfect. It's got everything that it needs, but it needs a seed to activate it. It needs a sperm to conceive. And this is the incorruptible seed of God's word. So you have to put this word in your heart and meditate on it day and night. Joshua chapter one, verse eight says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, when you've meditated in it day and night, then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. When you've meditated in it day and night, the word of God is that incorruptible seed. And the sad fact is that most of us aren't planting the seed or if we do plant the seed, we plant it like a devotional. Again, a devotional is not bad if that's just a special separated time to you shut out everything and focus on the Lord without distraction. But if you use a devotion and then the rest of the day you're carnal and you're thinking that you just wasted that devotional. It's not going to accomplish anything. You've got to get to where you live there. This seed has to remain in you. You need to get to where the word of God literally dominates and controls your life. You need to get to where the word of God is more important to you than the word of a banker, the word of a lawyer, the word of a doctor, your own body. You know, Daniel was talking about this yesterday about how we've already got it and you just got to get to a place that you aren't trying to get what you've already got. You just are meditating in the word and your body doesn't, doesn't speak to you as strongly as the word of God does. You can get to where the word of God is more real to you than what you see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. Most people think that's impossible. You're just dreaming. Well, don't wake me up because this is the way that I'm living. And the word of God is more real to me than anything else. Now, I'm not saying that I do it perfectly. There's to, I have to take my thoughts captive and deal with this, but this is my commitment. This is what I'm focused on and it's what I'm doing. And to the degree that I do it, it's working supernaturally. You know, I remember my board wanted me to go get a physical so that they could take out an insurance, keep me an insurance policy on me. And anyway, that's not what I would have done, but my board, it wasn't bad. And so I said, I'll do it. So anyway, I went to get this, uh, EK, this uh, test, I don't know exactly what you call it, but anyway, I, they put me on a treadmill and they wanted to hook these things up on my chest and they wanted to shave the hair on my chest. And I told them, I said, this is virgin hair. It's never been touched. You can't shave this hair. And so anyway, they put those things on my chest without shaving the hair on my chest. And so I got, and I was, I just seen my son raised from the dead. He was dead for over four hours and they called me and Jamie and I agreed and he was raised from the dead and he was already in a morgue stripped naked with a toe tag on and they had pronounced him dead near, over four hours and we spoke and he rose up from the dead and started talking and today he's alive and well. I talked to him yesterday. Thank you, Jesus. So I had just given them this testimony about my son being raised from the dead and uh, they didn't say anything, but th that was certainly not what they were used to. And so here I was on this treadmill and I was running and I began to start sweating and these things started falling off because <laughs> they hadn't shaved the hair on my chest. And so I was holding two of them. The doctor was holding two and the nurse was holding two. And here I was jogging with three people holding these things on. And anyway, when the, when the thing got over, the doctor was looking at this long printout and when it got to the 12 minute and 50, they said you could quit anytime. And it was only a 15 minute test. I could have quit, but somewhere around 13 minutes, just before 13 minutes, he saw something that was abnormal and he, he started grunting and looked at this and 
Then he wrote something down and he says, you go see this person today. Don't you go back to your office. You go, get, we're going to test you and we're going to put you in the hospital and we may do open heart surgery on you before the day is over. <laughs> and anyway, it took me just a few seconds and I looked in and I said, what? And he, he said, don't you, you just go do this. And I said, I don't believe that. That's a lie. Amen. I said, there's nothing wrong with my heart. And I guess his doctor wasn't used to somebody telling him he was a liar. And he said, what are you saying? And I said, you look at that and tell me that that says I got a serious heart problem. He says, well, really, it just was, it was one hundredth of something off. And he says, it might be nothing. Everybody's heart's a little bit different. I thought to myself, maybe it's because these things were falling off of my chest. He didn't even take that into account. But anyway, he says, we just, I just think it would be wisdom to go check. I said, that's not what you told me. You said I had a serious heart problem. I said, you lied to me. How dare you tell me I got a heart problem? And this, this guy just started backing up. And I mean, I laid into him and I told him, don't you dare tell me this. And he just tore this piece of paper up and said, leave. <laughs> and he flunked me on my test and wouldn't give me insurance. So I've got a doctor that's one of the leading surgeons in Shreveport and he had, he's on my board and he had me come down there and they put me on another test and they shot this dye into my veins. And he told me, he says, don't ever go by one of those treadmill tests. They are wrong 50% of the time. He says, never take one of those things. You got to have this dye put in you. And he checked me out and he said, you got the heart of a 17 year old. And so there was nothing wrong. But anyway, my point is how many people just fold when a doctor says something to you because you esteem the word of a doctor more than you do the word of God, more than you do the banker or anything else. You, you got to get to where the word of God is dominant in your life. And if you do that, you're in your spirit, you've already got everything. If you would sow the word of God in your heart and protect it. Did you know a woman, when she gets pregnant, she can't just be normal. She can't do everything normal. It does change the way you live. You have to protect that child and stuff. You have to protect the word when it's sown in your heart. But it is an incorruptible seed. It will produce every single time. And all you got to do is take that seed, sow it in your heart, give it time, protect it, and it will bring forth fruit automatically. <laughs> automatically. You know, before I started on television, I'd been on radio for decades and I struggled financially. Uh, we had creditors come after us. We were turned over to collection agencies. I just, uh, I had a revelation on healing and some other things, but finances was late coming to me. And as I knew that the Lord had told me I was going to be on television someday and I could feel like it was time for me to start on television. And I knew that if I was struggling paying my radio bills, I was only on like 120 something radio stations. I said, man, if I'm struggling now, it's going to be worse when I get on television. And so I needed a revelation. And you know what I did? I took like a hundred scriptures. This is in the nineties. And I wrote it out before we had computers and I wrote them out on a legal pad. And I, I just meditated on those scriptures. You know what I was doing? I was taking the incorruptible seed and planting it in my heart. And I did that for at least two years. And if you would have asked me what difference would it make, I couldn't have told you. There wasn't any visible difference outside. But then one day in Bible school, I won't go through the whole thing. It's like all of those scriptures just exploded on the inside of me. And I began to see truth about prosperity. And we begin to start prospering. And I mean, it has transformed my life. Did you know this is really how I got started in the word? Man, I could give you, I could spend a week talking about this. But when I was in Vietnam, this next parable about the uh, mustard seed being the smallest of all seeds, but when it's sown, it grows this huge tree. The Lord spoke to me my first week in Vietnam and I was desiring to be this huge tree. I said, God, that's what I want is all of this growth so that I could touch people all over the world. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, if I was to grant you your answer and give you the growth that you want in your ministry and stuff with your root, it's about an inch deep. He said the first bird to land on a branch and knock the whole thing over. The first puff of wind. Was, 
He said, you just forget the growth and you put down roots. You let the word get rooted in you. So when I was in Vietnam, I spent 10 to 15 hours a day, every day, just studying the word and meditating in the word. And then when I got out of Vietnam, I got married. And um, anyway, there's a lot of things that happened. But one of the things I did, I took a legal pad again, and I wrote out nothing but scripture references all the way across the page, all the way down the page, front and back, three pages worth of just scripture references that I, as I studied the word, I knew that God was speaking to me through these words, but I didn't, it hadn't worked yet. And I hadn't got the revelation, but I just got excited when I read these verses. So uh, when I got married, Jamie and I, I quit working, which probably wasn't the best thing to do, but anyway, that's what I did. And we struggled financially. And what I did for the first six months of our marriage, I would sit there and I would take those verses and I'd write out every single verse longhand. And I'd meditate on every word of every verse. There was, I actually had a guy that asked me for that uh, piece of paper one time and I gave it to him and he brought it back to me and showed it to me and it was phenomenal, the verses that were on there. They're the, the exact things that I teach now. And anyway, uh, I would just write those things out and I'd spend 10 or 15 hours a day just writing scripture and meditating on these things. And then after I did that, Jamie and I lived in a little one bedroom apartment and what I'd do so that I wouldn't interrupt her day, I'd go into our closet. And it was just about maybe five feet by three feet or something like that. I'd move the shoes out of the way and I would close the door and I'd sit in that closet and pray in tongues for an hour or two saying, God, what do these verses mean? You know what that was? That was like putting miracle grow on that seed that I was planting. And I would just pray and ask, God, what does this mean? And I did that every day for six months. Write out hundreds of scriptures. Pray over them an hour or two. And then it's like an atomic bomb went off on the inside of me after six months. All of a sudden, revelation. Do you know everything I'm teaching today happened to me in 1973 I got a glimpse of it. It's like the word of God just came alive. Now I've got much more understanding. I've, I, I can teach it better. I've got more scriptures that relate to it, but the truths that the Lord showed me about grace and all of these kind of things, that came to me in one week's period of time. I mean, I had so much revelation come to me that I actually said, God, stop. I can't handle it. I can't, I can't control. I can't contain everything. I wished I hadn't have said that. But I mean, the word of God transformed me. And anything good that's happening in my life today happened because I have taken the word and put it in my heart and meditated on it until the logos became rhema, until it became alive on the inside of me. And it has produced every good thing that's ever happened in my life. We've got $150 million worth of assets right here that are paid for debt free. And we've got, uh, we've got many more. We got many more assets that we're in the process of building and things like that. All of that is a result of the word of God. I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Billy will tell you that man, we just had a come to Jesus meeting about a month ago or something and he was saying things, but that's not what it meant to me. I don't talk like business ease. And uh, so anyway, he had to explain to my little hick mind what he was talking about and stuff. I'm not the sharpest person around. And yet because the word of God is working in my life, God protects me. We've had people come into this ministry that tried to destroy this ministry and tear it apart. And did you know what? God has protected me when I wasn't sharp enough to know what to do. I'm just like Teflon. Nothing sticks to me. You know, the scripture says great peace. I think it's Psalms 119, 165, something like that. Great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. And you know what? You just can't offend me. I just don't get upset over stuff. But you know why? Because of the word of God, because it's so real. And I know that ultimately I'm going to win. Even if I mess up, even if I fall, a righteous man will fall seven times and get back up. 
and I know that I'm going to win. I'm like a cork. You can take me to the bottom of the pond and I'll rise again. I don't care what happens. I am going to prosper. God's blessings are on me. I'm blessed. Abraham received the blessing of God. And God said, I'll bless anybody who blesses you and I'll curse anybody who curses you. And in that same chapter, Genesis chapter 12, he goes down and lies about his wife, Sarah. But instead of God rebuking Abraham, he rebuked Pharaoh. You know why? Because Abraham was blessed. He had a covenant with God and God was dealing with him based on the covenant, not based on his performance. And so God blessed Abraham even when he didn't deserve to be blessed. I am now blessed and I know that God is going to bless me and things are going to work and stuff. So I'm telling you, the word of God is the most important thing. There is a seed in this Bible for whatever you need. There is a seed here. There are multiple seeds for anything that you need. And all you need is to plant the seed. In your spirit, you've got the resurrection power of Jesus. You are perfect. You are as pure and holy, as healed, as blessed, as prosperous as Jesus is in your spirit. But there has to be a seed sown for that life to be released. And you have to give it time. And if you'll do that, if you'll get into this word of God and just meditate in it day and night to observe everything that it says, you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. It's impossible for you not to do it. Romans chapter eight, verse six, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In John chapter six, verse 63, Jesus says, it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's word is spirit. So to be spiritually minded is to be word minded. And if you get to where the word of God is literally dominating you, all it will do is produce life and peace. It can't produce anything else. If you're having something other than life and peace, you've been thinking something other than word. Now, we live in a fallen world and Satan is going to take shots at us. You could have something come, but it won't stick if you continue to live in the word. The word of God will always cause you to come out on top. It's this simple, but it's not this easy. Hardest thing you'll ever do is get to where you just are focused on the word of God and that God's word is more real to you than the word of anybody else, even your own word. It takes discipline. It's like um, Daniel was talking about yesterday. You have to labor to rest in what Jesus has done. You have to labor. It takes effort to get to where God's word is more real to you than what you see and what you feel. But it's well worth the effort. And I promise you, if you do that, there's not a person in here that if you would receive what has already been said in this conference... And if you were to receive this and go out and implement it and live in it, there's not a person in here that wouldn't be totally healed, totally blessed, prospered, joy, peace. You would have the love of God ex explode on the inside of you. It'll work for anybody. The seed is incorruptible. It never misses. The only variable is us. And if you'll commit yourself to it, you don't have to be a silver vessel. You just got to be a surrendered vessel. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Have we got a break coming up? Yes, All right. So I'm down to the second right now. Take your break and we'll be back at 1040. Did y'all notice how I ended on the exact second? I'm trying to teach them to do this.